I'm Krista Tippett. The ideals and rituals of marriage in America are infused with biblical imagery. This hour, we'll explore nuances of biblical teachings about marriage, family, and divorce, the surprising ambiguity of the New Testament, and the striking practicality of Jewish tradition across the ages. The marriage contract talks about all the duties that the man has to his wife, not the other way around. What the Torah itself tries to do is to take an inherently unequal situation in the ancient world and to make it more equal. The real tragedy in Christian theology about marriage is that it has tended to look only at the sacred texts and has tended to ignore the experience of actual married people. This is Speaking of Faith. Stay with us. Look for Krista Tippett's celebrated new book, A Chronicle of Religion in Our Time, Speaking of Faith, the book, in bookstores now. I'm Krista Tippett. American ideals of courtship and marriage echo with biblical imagery. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. But what does the Bible really say, and how has it been taught across the centuries in which the institution of marriage has changed dramatically? From American Public Media, this is Speaking of Faith, Public Radio's conversation about religion, meaning, ethics, and ideas. Today, a thought-provoking discussion about marriage, family, and divorce. With a rabbi and a New Testament scholar, we'll explore the nuances of Jewish and Christian teachings. Each of these men is, in some sense, more conservative than liberal when it comes to theology. But they offer creative ways to imagine the problems and promises of modern relationships. My first guest, Rabbi Elliot Dorf, is rector and distinguished professor of philosophy at the American Jewish University in Los Angeles. He's a leading voice on law and ethics in the conservative movement of Judaism. From ancient times, Jewish thought on the subject of marriage has been strikingly reality-based. Rabbinic dialogue gives detailed instructions on how to nurture a marriage. It stresses the needs of women as well as men. And the rabbis always conceded that marriage is difficult and that failure is possible. When Rabbi Elliot Dorf reflects on marriage, He begins where the Hebrew Bible begins, with the two stories of creation in the book of Genesis. Sexuality and the body, he says, were among God's first gifts to humankind. First of all, God creates the human being, the entirety of the human being, and calls it not only good, but very good in the opening chapter of Genesis. That's not just the soul, as it were, that's the body as well. And so from the point of view of the Jewish tradition, the body, the emotions, the will, the mind, um, all of these things are part of God's creation. They are morally neutral, all of them, and their moral valence, as it were, depends upon how we use those things. And then in terms of specific specifically the the energies of the body, what the Jewish tradition is interested in doing is taking the various desires of the body and channeling them toward good purpose as defined by the Torah. And sexuality would be considered an energy of the body. That's right. One of the energies of the body. Sort of like your desire for food. What the Jewish tradition does with that is, first of all, the dietary laws as to uh, what you may eat in order to to give you a sense of the the fact that the animal kingdom uh, and life even in the animal kingdom is something to be respected. Well, in terms of sex, Both in the stories at the beginning of Genesis and also in the laws of Judaism, it's clear that there are two purposes uh, for sex as the tradition understood it. In the first chapter of Genesis, you have be fruitful and multiply. So clearly, procreation is one of the purposes of marriage. And then in the second chapter of Genesis, you've got it's not good for one to live alone. So a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife, wife, literally sticks to his wife, right? Clearly, then, the other purpose of sex within marriage is companionship. You know, I have spent a lot of time with Genesis over the years, but I noticed for the first time when I was getting ready to talk to you that in the first chapter of Genesis, which seems to be the more egalitarian story, Mm. right? Man and woman are created together. Right. The emphasis is on procreation. 
Yes. Be fruitful and multiply. In the second, in the second and third chapters, the Garden of Eden, which feminists have interpreted as where the woman is subordinate and woman is taken from man's rib, which feels a bit insulting to women. Mm-hmm. The emphasis is on companionship. Well, actually, the rabbis carry that on. I mean, on the legal level, you have the commandment to be fruitful and multiply. And then the other commandment that's relevant to us is in Exodus chapter 21, in which the Torah says that when a man takes a wife, then her food, her clothing, and and her conjugal rights, he may not diminish. But the Jewish tradition from the very beginning assumes mm. that women have sexual desires just as much as men do, and that satisfying both the, the sexual desires of men and of women is what marriage is all about, or at least one of the purposes of marriage, right? And so, and the rabbis as, do what they usually do with the commandments, namely, they then try to define the commandments. So what, how do they define it? Well, a man may never force himself upon a woman. They understood marital rape. And how often does he have to offer her to to have sex in order to satisfy her desires? Well, according to the Mishnah, it depends upon what he does for a living. So (laughs) if he's home every night, then he has to offer to have sex with her every night. If he's a donkey driver and home every other night, then every other night. And if he's a scholar, then once a week on Friday night on the Sabbath. Theologically, or what is the rationale? Is it, is it simply that our sexuality is part of what it is to be human and that there's an understanding that that needs to find expression? Right. And that marriage is the proper place. And that's in a good which thing. It, and that's, that's a very that's good a proper thing. Place. That's, it's a very good thing. It's not right to remain alone. And hence you get, this is not just theoretical, a long history of of matchmakers. Um, you know, I remember that when I finished rabbinical school, if uh, we were told already in rabbinical school that if you weren't married by the time you finished, at that time, uh, it was only men that were being ordained, uh, the sisterhood would do absolutely everything in, in its power to get you married off within the first year that you were <laughs> you know, serving a congregation, which is indeed true. Yeah. And then I think that the structure of Jewish life also supports marriage. Even something like Sabbath, just having right. that downtime and that rest. The Sabbath is probably the best antidote to a workaholic phenomenon in America mm-hmm. that I think has ever existed. Because effectively it says that from sunset on Friday, actually a few, about 20 minutes before uh, sunset on Friday until about 40 minutes after sunset on Saturday, you may not work. And um, you do have, uh, on, on the contrary, obligations to be with family and friends and be part of, the, go, to, go to synagogue. And basically, it's one of the most important ways of renewing you know, family life. Um, it was always important, but it's especially important when people are sort of eating breakfast on the run. They often don't have lunch together. Even dinner, I mean, many families, especially with teenagers, you know, don't are, are not able to have together during the week because they all have these extracurricular activities and the like. I think that's probably a good discipline for a modern <laughs> that's marriage. Right. That's exactly <laughs> right. And it, it has a lot of symbolism also because the Sabbath is supposed to be sort of a reenactment of the Garden of Eden and also a foretaste. The rabbis talk about this as a foretaste of the world to come. So it's supposed to be this idyllic time in which you don't have to work for a living. All of that has been prepared ahead of time. Um, you're not allowed to cook on the Sabbath. You're not allowed to work on the Sabbath. You're not, I mean, right, so you're not nobody's allowed to write. harried and overburdened. Nobody's harried. In most traditional homes, they don't answer the phone on the Sabbath and things in that order, right? Yeah. A cell phone, whatever. Um, no computers, no, no email, none of that. And you simply talk to each other and you sing together and you catch up with each other. And this ultimate sense of being completed comes both in terms of time together and in terms of sumptuous meals and in terms of time to take a nap on Saturday afternoon and sex between husband and wife. Rabbi Elliot Dorf. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is Speaking of Faith from American Public Media, today exploring marriage, family, and divorce in the biblical traditions. From ancient times, Jewish tradition was supportive of marriage in practical ways, and Jewish marriages have traditionally been more stable than the general population. But in recent decades, this began to change. In response, the University of Judaism in Los Angeles, now called the American Jewish University, created one of the most successful marriage preparation courses in the country. Rabbi Elliot Dorf is rector there. Yeah. 
It started in 1975. It was Rabbi Aaron Wise, who had been the rabbi of a large conservative synagogue in Los Angeles. And in 2000, they did a survey of all of the people who had gone through the program, and uh, 8% had ultimately ended in divorce. So how do you explain that? In some ways, because uh, when people go through, it's a 10-week program. It's 10 couples together, and sometimes during the course of the 10-week program, when, and because of the curriculum, which gets them to talk to each other about a variety of different important things, sometimes they decide, you know, maybe we shouldn't get married. Hmm. So some of it, which is much better for them to decide beforehand than afterward. So some of it is that, but, but a lot of it has to do with the fact that they get skills through these courses in terms of how to interact with each other. I mean, the first, it's 10 sessions, I think it's the first five, deal with communication skills. They come to talk about with each other and then in a group about strategies to deal with parents, uh, strategies okay. to deal with friends of one who are not friends of the other, issues of jobs versus children and how to handle them. Well, one really important one is how do you have a fight and still come out married? And part of it has to do also with expectations. I love Broadway musicals, so the way that I like to put it is this, right? The, the Hollywood image of marriage is from South Pacific. Some enchanted evening, you will meet a stranger across the crowded room, and you'll know even then that somehow you'll meet her again and again, right? Yeah. And so the image that you get is that marriage is a series of enchanted evenings. And then when you get married and you find out that indeed there are some enchanted evenings, but most of them are sort of ho-hum and some of them are downright unenchanted, you you begin to think that if that was your expectation, you begin to think, well, maybe this is not the marriage for me. And you break up as opposed to feather on the roof, right? After 25 years, do you love me? Well, for 25 years, we've done this, that, and that. Now you ask me, do I love you? Well, I suppose I do. And I suppose I love you too. After 25 years, it doesn't change a thing, but it's nice to know, yeah. right? Now, yeah. now there, I mean, what that bespeaks is, I think, the traditional Jewish understanding of marriage. That is, you get married primarily because you like each other enough to do the work of family together. That is, to grow old together, to have companionship, to have children, to raise those children. My own grandmother, my mother's mother, was uh, had an arranged marriage. My mother asked her why she married my grandfather. And she said, well, because I had heard he was a kind man, and that was enough for me. And they had an idyllic marriage. When you think about these practical skills of communication and knowing how to fight, is that also something that you think about theologically? I mean, those are things we've learned in modern times about what makes a good modern marriage. Mm I'm wondering if the tradition also expanded on this notion of companionship. Absolutely. There's, um, there are passages in Jewish literature which talk about how a man is supposed to, to try to be very sensitive to his wife's moods. Um, he's, supposed to on, he's supposed to honor his wife more than himself. There are even manuals that were written in the Middle Ages about how a man is supposed to uh, treat his wife and others having to do with sexual activity, you know, to make sure that it's pleasurable for her as well as for him. There are a series of other things. I mean, of course, Jewish marriages were to some extent influenced by the marriages of the cultures in which they lived. So the relationships between husbands and wives living in, in Muslim countries were to some extent influenced by Islam, Islamic practices and in northern European countries by Christian practices. But throughout the tradition, you get, you get love poetry. I mean, see, Song of Songs yes. is, is a book in the Bible, yes. right, which is simply love poetry. And even though Rabbi Akiva later interpreted it as the love poem between God and the people Israel, uh, nevertheless, if you simply look, I mean, I'm sure he understood that, as, as everyone else does, that it's just simply love poetry that is, frankly, very graphic. Um, and, and is it describing marital love? Some of it is, and some of it is not. I mean, some of it is, some of it is courting. It's not at all afraid about talking about the desirous nature of the body yeah. of the opposite sex in both directions, by the way, because there are some of the poems that are written by women and some of them written by men. But interestingly, along the lines that you were just asking about, in the wedding ceremony, the only description of the couple themselves is as Re'im Ha'avim, the loving companions where loving is the adjective, but companions is the noun, right? So they are, they are first and foremost companions. 
the word help meet that you know mm-hmm. has become sort of a cliche i think help Asian help me yes. isn't that a very interesting word in the hebrew that has a lot more complexity yes, what is it does. what yeah. what is that uh, connote well, the word is, uh, I mean, they're frankly a, a series of different... And that's in Genesis. That's you know in that? Genesis. Mm-hmm. That's correct. Uh, this is the second chapter of Genesis in which man is alone, Adam is alone, and he feels lonely. And then Eve is created as Azer Kenegdo. And both of the Hebrew words are subject to a lot of interpretation. First of all, the word la'azor means to help. But then the word konegdo means literally opposite him. But it also, it also can mean on a par with him. So as much as she is a help to him, he is a help to her, right? So it could be understood in an egalitarian kind of way. It's usually not understood that way. It's usually understood as the woman being the help to the man. But opposite, but, doesn't that also imply the tension that we know between men and women in marriage, which it sort of acknowledges also as a constructive thing? Or right. Like, right. Exactly. The tradition recognizes the fact that men and women are different. I mean, it has some of that, of course, comes out of certain stereotypical roles that the uh, for husbands and for wives that the tradition creates. And as a matter of fact, when it comes down to duties, the Talmud spells out what the duties are of a man toward his wife and of a woman toward her husband. And I think the important thing to, to note there is that it's not just in one direction. It's not just that the woman has duties to her husband. It's, it's quite the opposite. It's if anything, the marriage contract that, that we use all, talks about all the duties that the man has to his wife, not the other way around. Hmm. And what the rabbis try to do, for the, what the Torah itself tries to do, is to take an inherently unequal situation in the ancient world and to make it more equal. Rabbi Elliot Dorf. The Jewish Torah provides for divorce, And so from the earliest times, Jewish tradition has not treated divorce as a sin. Rabbi Dorf has written that divorce is sometimes the right thing to do, sometimes a tragedy, and often both. The Talmud teaches that the temple altar itself sheds tears upon the termination of a marriage. It sees divorce as, as a sad thing, but not as a sin. And so it's clearly not something that one should do flippantly. But on the other hand, sometimes divorce is what, really, you know, what is necessary. And I mean, do you think that you know, in some ways you, that might be surprising because marriage is so highly valued? But right. on the other hand, because marriage is, is described in a complex way, is the allowance of divorce also an acknowledgement of right. that? That's right. Basically... See, in American law until the 1970s, except in Nevada, if you wanted to get divorced, you had to show either adultery or insanity in your partner. That's why Governor Nelson Rockefeller in 1968 had to fly to Nevada to divorce his wife because he wasn't willing to say that she was insane or adulterous. But in the Jewish tradition, this goes back to the, to the rabbis, uh, there don't have to be any grounds for divorce. It can simply be what we would call incompatibility. They don't like each other anymore. And... And so they may divorce. The tradition did what it could to try to delay the process, so to try to get them to reconcile, because it understood that that came, that divorce comes at a great cost to both partners, and certainly to a great, a great cost to the children, okay. if there are. And so you don't do this lightly, but at the same time, if this is the right and proper thing to do, then you don't have to show that, you don't have to demonstrate that to any rabbis or a court or anything like that. The court only supervises the process. And you've said that while it's allowed and allowed for in these practical ways, it's also seen as an occasion of deep regret Divorce, and yes. sadness and, and grief. And I wonder also, does Jewish ritual also make a place for that sadness to be expressed? Part of what happens is, is that the divorce writ has to be written specifically for this couple. That's one of the ways in which the rabbis delayed the process in hopes of making sure that they really needed to be divorced. Once it is, then there's this ceremony in which the man gives it to the woman or her agent. They don't, they don't have to be together in order for this to do this. Sometimes it's too painful for the couple to do. But if they are there and doing it together, then the man gives the document to 
the woman who takes it in cupped hands and then walks with it for several steps to indicate you know, graphically that what's happening is that the two of them are leaving each other. And in our own time, there have been a number of other rituals that people have devised to talk about the grief that men and women have in marriage. It's mm-hmm. much just because of the way that Anglo-Saxons are sort of created in our country. It's much harder for men to express that kind of grief than than it is for women. And so one of the things that's that's been sort of interesting is men's support groups as well as women's support groups and this kind of thing. It's very hard to get men to come to those kinds of support groups, truthfully, yeah. Yeah. because the way that men are acculturated to American society is uh, that they're not supposed to show their feelings, which which is frankly crazy. Here's something I'd like to ask you bef- before we go. You are a rabbi and you have four adult children. Right. And I'm I'm wondering... As you watch them be adults in our time, what are some of the ways that you see them struggling with this tradition, particularly of marriage and divorce uh, in Judaism? And and what are some of the ways that their struggles bring you back to, to reconsider the tradition? My own family is in some ways really statistically, I think, fairly typical of uh, other families. I have a daughter and a son who got married, married people who were very much part of the community and the like. I have a son who married somebody who was part of the Jewish community, but they got divorced two and a half years later. And then about seven years after that, uh, he married a Jew by choice. Um, that is somebody who, a woman who, who converted, converted to, to Judaism, Judaism okay. right? Mm-hmm. And I have a daughter who came out as a lesbian and uh, was just recently artificially inseminated and gave us our first grandson. So you have son. a modern family. I have a modern family. And and how do you you hold that together as the biblical norm, as an ideal, with the reality that divorce happens, that you have a daughter who will never marry a man? Right. How do you reconcile that ideal, that norm with these other realities, which you also clearly, you don't judge, you're not condemning these no, other. No, not so, at all. I so mean, I how think, does it work? I mean, how are we supposed to take, live with those norms? Well, I think that the tradition very much prized marriage and saw that as the primary way to do it. It also understood divorce and did not condemn it as a sin. It saw it as being something that you do only after a lot of consideration and, and every attempt to reconcile. But But sometimes there was divorce. It did not know about uh, single parents, except in the case of widowhood or divorce. And in the case of single parents, it tried to get them remarried as quickly as possible. And interestingly, that continues on in the Jewish community. Even though the rate of divorce in the contemporary Jewish community is more or less the same as it is in the general American population, the rate of remarriage in the Jewish community is far higher. Gays and lesbians, of course, out of the closet is a whole new phenomenon in our generation, let alone they're having children, qua gays and lesbians. And I also think that it's not good for them to be alone any more than it's good for for straights to be alone. And so I think we in the Jewish community need to create the matchmaker again. Rabbi Elliot Dorf is rector and distinguished professor of philosophy at the American Jewish University in Los Angeles. Since I spoke with him in 2003, Rabbi Dorf has co-authored a groundbreaking rabbinic opinion that is now one of three approaches allowed within conservative Judaism. It holds in part that the Jewish reverence for human dignity supersedes most previous rabbinic prohibitions on homosexuality. Read about all three approaches on our website, speakingoffaith.org. This is Speaking of Faith. After a short break, New Testament scholar Luke Timothy Johnson of Emory University, he says Christian teachings on marriage and family send conflicted messages that may not simply represent what we now call family values. Many times we can't fit all of my conversation into the radio broadcast. Here's your chance to hear what was cut. Go to speakingoffaith.org and download an MP3 of my complete, unedited conversation with Elliot Dorf. Also, listen to our programs in the manner you'd like. Sign line at faithstreams.com. 
Join the conversation about Speaking of Faith programs. Purchase discussion guides, program CDs, and other tools for your small group, book club, or classroom at speakingoffaith.org. Welcome back to Speaking of Faith, Public Radio's conversation about religion, meaning, ethics, and ideas. I'm Krista Tippett. Today, a thought-provoking exploration of the nuances of Jewish and Christian teachings on marriage, family, and divorce. Biblical symbols and phrases are part of the American rituals of courtship, marriage, and family, even for many who are not religious at all. And Christian teachings are woven into American culture's moral sensibility about marriage and sexuality. In recent decades, as the divorce rate grew and fewer and fewer families have included two biological married parents, more and more Christian groups have created marriage enrichment programs and pro-family movements. But according to my next guest, Christian tradition expresses ambivalence towards marriage and family. Emory University theologian Luke Timothy Johnson is one of the most highly regarded experts on Christian traditions and the author of a classic work, The Writings of the New Testament. He brings historical, literary, and theological context to modern questions surrounding marriage, family, and divorce. It's not a simple matter to be reading these ancient texts as guiding Mm -hmm. our lives. Relatively simple, though involved to read them as historical sources or as cultural texts. That's fun and interesting because it's other. But when we try to bring them home and to think about how do our lives correspond to them, how can we imagine our own lives while imagining Scripture simultaneously, it's difficult. Why do we do it? The same texts that confuse us are also the ones that give us life. Luke Johnson says that the vigorous pro-family message coined in our time is not to be found easily in the New Testament. The New Testament does not provide Christians with a positive living model of marriage. Muslims have a prophet who married several times and fathered children. Jews have many examples of marriage and family in all its complexity among the patriarchs and matriarchs. But Jesus never married. Jesus' disciples left their families behind to follow him. Later, the Apostle Paul remained celibate and preached this as a moral ideal to new Christians. In short, modern Christians inherit in Scripture a deeply conflicted message about whether and how marriage and family matter. For Luke Timothy Johnson, this does not mean that modern people can't consult Christian tradition for guidance. But taking it seriously means acknowledging its complexity and its contradictions. The real tragedy in Christian theology about marriage is that it has tended to look only at the sacred texts. This is really important and has tended to ignore the experience of actual married people. I mean, a great deal of Christian theology was carried out by monks and celibates Mm -hmm. who quite literally didn't know who they're talking about. Mm -hmm. So what Jesus doesn't give us, what the New Testament doesn't give us, where are we going to learn it? Well, one way by default is to simply take all of those things in the Bible that affirm marriage, sex, and family in a sort of a straightforward way, losing that critical edge that Christianity brings to that. You're right. You can pluck out verses which affirm marriage. Absolutely. But talk about holistically what is to be found there. On the subject of sex, On the subject of, yeah, sex, marriage, marriage yeah. and family. It's a, it's a whole collection of thoughts. Isn't That's it? correct. And, and they go together. They're interrelated. Mm-hmm. And what really distinguishes the Christian collection, the New Testament canon, is this deeply conflictual character. So on the one side, you have, let us say, with family. You have clear passages that affirm family and the household. Um, For example, in Paul's letters to his delegates, qualities of good parenting are qualifications for leadership within the community. Uh, Young widows are to marry and uh, raise their children and run households. So all of this is very affirming of family, and you can pick out those texts. On the other side, Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you have to hate your father and mother. You know, leave your wife and your husband and your children, by the way, abandon them and come follow me. A reading from the book of Matthew. Jesus said, for I have come to set a man against his father 
and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. A reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 34 through 37. I've heard lots of sermons in my life trying to massage that and interpret it so that it is palatable. Again, this is the case of Christians tending to privilege one set of texts and ignoring the other set. Mm -hmm. And all Christians do that. The question is, are they doing it with any degree of responsibility at all? I have to share a story with you on this very point. Uh, Many years ago, I gave a a talk at a conference called God Doesn't Like Families. And I basically wanted to trace that stream in Scripture Mm -hmm. from Abraham on, right? Leave your family, leave your home. Yes. Right? Yes. And running through the New Testament and suggesting God doesn't seem to be that interested in families. Or as a colleague of mine, Luther Smith, memorably said in a sermon one time, Uh, What the Bible seems to say is that families are necessary, but they're not sufficient. And I was asked by a local parish if I would come give a talk on that subject. And I sent them the title, God Doesn't Like Families. I arrived in the church. I opened the bulletin and it said, God Like Families. So I began my presentation by saying, this is the problem. So they had misprinted <laughs> they your... Had mis- quite deliberately. They quite thought my deliberate. title was very right. much too scandalous. God-like families. That's yeah. right. And so clearly one problem within one version of Christianity is a kind of an idolatrous posture with regard to family. So that family is not only necessary, which all of us would, would acknowledge, but that it's also sufficient. And losing that edge, which is essential to the biblical tradition, the prophetic edge of moving beyond family, moving beyond kinship into a larger world, which is God's creation. But are those two things intention? How are they intention? Indeed, they are intention. Does that make it more difficult to be committed to your family, necessarily? I think it actually helps being committed in a more appropriate way. I think, for example, that good parenting does not have as its goal keeping kids at home. It's preparing them to be free to leave home so that a certain degree of distancing is required even to do the job, Mm -hmm. Uh, that if you cling too closely, you ruin them, just as if you abandon them, you ruin them. So there is that tension. It's probably true in marriage, isn't it? Exactly the truth. Giving the other, giving the partner space is is really important in in order even to have intimacy. So that if there's no, if there's not really two persons there, you really can't have intimacy. So similarly, the draw outside the kinship system to serve a larger world I suspect is a premise for really good commitment to the kinship Mm -hmm. system, to family. Unless I see our family life as part of a larger ecology, the tendency is to make it idolatrous, to absolutize it. And we've certainly done that, especially in our age with the nuclear family, right? I mean, it just gets tinier and tinier, and it is the center of the universe. Absolutely. So, I mean, what you're saying is you can, you can affirm it and you can be critical at the same time. Yes, but and I'm also saying this. And the Bible this. asks us to do that. Yes, but I'm also saying this. These alternative forms of family that people are thinking about now mm-hmm. also provide us an opportunity to think about what is, what is the essence of family itself as opposed to what are the accidentals of family. So that we can view our present societal situation of fatherless families, and in some ways it really does represent a crisis, obviously. Homosexual families, adoptive families, for example, or other kinds of groupings of people. We can regard that as a challenge to the family, a threat, or we can regard it as a reminder that kinship and belonging in in the human reality is a matter of social construction, and it is a matter of choice, even one's own family. Mm-hmm. I mean, one can be born into a biological family, obviously, many of us are, and leave it, and leave it behind, and hate it, and we just want to get free of it. If family is not just given, but chosen. Often about love, they were not usually speaking of the romantic love we associate with marriage. The most common New Testament notion of love was agape, or practical love. 
I think that the deepest Christian dimension of love is this dimension of agape, of self-giving, of mutuality. I apply this absolutely to my life in as concrete a way as trying to, to cook a gumbo. I mean, that if my little daughter came knocking at the door of my study when I'm trying to write a paper, that is the call of God to me. Daddy, come play with me. On the other hand, if I answer every time and go play with her, I make a tyrant out of her. Right. <laughs> if I never answer the door because I've got my project to do, then she stops knocking. And there's another loss. So this agapic love, this love of looking to the good of the other is never simple. It calls for what I call the asceticism of attentiveness. I mean, one really has to be alert at every moment to what are the real needs of the other and what are my own needs and how do I live in a way in which there is flourishing this word agape that you're referring to is the Greek. There are different words for love, which connote different things that we tend to mush together exactly in the word right. love, right? So there's eros, which is a more erotic, romantic Romantic love, love and that's usually the basis for marriage right. in the Western world. But agape is really the way of living in the New Testament, isn't it? Which that's is, right. has this, oh, this, pra- this connotation of practical care. Looking to the good of the other for the other's sake. Mm-hmm. And, and so, not for your sake. Not for my own sake. Mm-hmm. Now, in between those two kinds of love, and I think very important for married life, the middle term, if you will, is the love that's called philia, friendship, which I think is extraordinarily important. The friendship in our contemporary world tends to be acquaintance, sort of a casual thing. For ancient philosophers and for most of Christian theology and Jewish theology, friendship is one of the most important philosophical topics because the friend is another self. And there is an intimacy of not of gazing into each other's eyes, as Saint Azupari said, but of looking together in the same direction. Hmm. And I think a marriage without friendship is not a real marriage. A marriage can lose some of the erotic element, can't lose the friendship dimension. And I think that you present this in some of your papers that, you know, Paul also, like Jesus, was not married. He was leading what looks like a celibate life, right? I think that's quite clear, yeah. Okay. So you can read some of what's in the New Testament and feel that it's quite dismissive of sexuality, that it's a problem, right? That you sort of have to address, but you don't want to spend too much time on. But you can also read it that it's acknowledged to be a powerful Mm -hmm. dimension of life and that precisely because it is so powerful, it's important that it be ordered and, and that it be fulfilling in that marital relationship so that Christians can get on with all the other important things in life. Is that a fair reading? I think that's a very fair reading. And I think the, the single greatest and most important text here is Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. This is the famous passage in which Paul says it's better to marry than burn. But a more careful reading uh, reveals that this is really quite a remarkable passage. It's remarkable, first of all, simply because of its gender equality. Unlike any philosophical text that I know in antiquity, he addresses both partners. He addresses the man. He addresses the woman. And he carries that all the way through the discussion. This is quite thrilling to me. From a letter of the Apostle Paul to the new Christians at Corinth. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a set time, to devote yourselves to prayer, and then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. To the unmarried and the widows I say that it is well for them to remain unmarried, as I am. But if they are not practicing self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to be aflame with passion. A reading from 1 Corinthians. Paul's argument is, for him, it's not that sex is unimportant. It's so powerful. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty positive view of of what marriage is about, I think. And, you know, it strikes me often that in our society, well, there's a great obsession with sexuality in general, but what is dividing churches now is this matter of homosexuality, is different kinds of sexual lifestyles aside from marriage. But that in the sweep of the New Testament, there's much, much, much more teaching about marriage and divorce, which at the same time that that alternative sexual lifestyles have grown, 
the institution of marriage is in huge disarray. I mean, how do you read what the New Testament says about divorce and what that has to say to us today? Yeah, I think you're right. I'd like to pick up your first comment yeah. about we're so sexualized. We obsess about sexuality. Whether or not we're actually more robustly sexual, I think, is a really open and interesting question. In my view, homosexuality has become a scapegoat for churches to keep them from focusing upon the genuine lack of engagement with the very serious issues with sexuality. With heterosexuality. With heterosexuality. Yeah. And my argument is that the church must be against porneia. The church must stand against sexual sin. Yeah, and porneia, I think, is very interesting. You know, you talk about what's happening with internet pornography, and you know, the Greek word that's used in the New Testament is porneia. Porneia. And, that, and that's, you translate that as sexual sin. Sexual yeah, immorality in the broadest sense. Mm-hmm. So it, it includes prostitution. It clearly would obviously include pornography and all these kinds of things. So the church has to take a stand against this. Forms of sexuality that are violent, that are manipulative, that are exploitative, that are breaking boundaries, obviously, all these things are clearly incompatible, that are non-covenanted. My argument about this homosexuality thing is, is that we need to sort of level the playing field a little bit and recognize that what counts for homosexuality also counts for heterosexuality. And so that if, if we're going to forbid porneia on one side of the ledger, namely homosexuals, we can't approve of uh, the baths or promiscuity and so forth, then we have to also look at the playboy lifestyle with equal seriousness. So the issues then of divorce that you bring up, this is really quite remarkable. If Jesus ever said anything seriously... <laughs> It's this, right? Paul. This meaning? Divorce. Don't divorce. And yet, in effect, divorce has become a way of life Mm -hmm. for Christians. Biblical scholar Luke Timothy Johnson. Here's one of the New Testament passages in which Jesus speaks strongly against divorce. Some Pharisees came to Jesus, and to test him they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that the one who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. A reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 19, verses 3 through 6. The New Testament is pretty unequivocal about divorce. I mean, so you have the sayings of Jesus saying, don't divorce. Now, it's clear that this is a really hard saying from the beginning because we have it in an absolute form in Mark. And in Matthew's gospel, the saying of Jesus is repeated twice. But we see that the Matthean community is already struggling with the absoluteness of Jesus' command by inserting an acceptive clause, except for porneia or except for on chastity, right? Mm-hmm. So there's a, there's a wiggle room here. You right. can divorce if, if your partner's uh, promiscuous or something, or adulterous. Mm-hmm. And then Paul, again, he affirms the divorce thing, that is, the indissolubility of marriage. But then he also goes on to say, but if an unbeliever chooses to separate and doesn't want to hang around, then the partner is free. So my point is that we see within the pages of the New Testament itself a struggle with the absoluteness of Jesus' demand. And that's partly because Jesus is envisaging the order of creation, and we actually are we claiming we're living in the new creation, but it's, we're also still living within the realm of sin, inadequacy, failure, and all of these things. Now, your question, though, is also, what should we think about these texts as we go through the struggles of life? And it seems to me that here, again, I want to bring this back to the level playing field with homosexuality and heterosexuality. Mm -hmm. Plain fact is, we don't live by a lot of what Scripture says. And in a variety of ways, we seek to negotiate that gap between what we do and what Scripture says. Anybody who says they just live by the New Testament is just lying, either to themselves or to you. Number one, because it's impossible, because Scripture says such conflicting things. Right, you can't live all those different ways at once. You can't live all those ways. You can't be a Presbyterian and a Roman Catholic simultaneously (laughs) in terms of church order. And they are not a simple script that we live. 
they really represent an ideal often toward which we strive. If we think of scripture as something, a script that I simply enact, once I fail to do that, I've got to toss out the scripture. I mean, hmm. there's no relationship anymore. Hmm. It's sort of like uh, I'm in a relationship with a spouse and I've looked lustfully at somebody. And, Oops, I, I've already committed adultery in effect, so let's split. Rather than let's work to repair this or let's get past this thing. Same thing with the scripture stuff. I mean, so that I think that what, what the New Testament is presenting to us on, on marriage and divorce is an ideal. And we fall short of it. But we don't want to eliminate those texts because we don't match up to them. Because if we normalize divorce, as our culture has done, if we view it as uh, something as trivial as changing high schools, we really do weaken marriage, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we we just have sort of serial polygamy, in Mm -hmm. effect, which is very, very bad for children, very bad for becoming a robust human who is able to deal and work, as you said, through stresses, through hard times and so forth. You know, I'm, I left a monastery. My wife is a divorced woman. I mean, I've struggled with these issues very much. Mm-hmm. But I think we need to have the text say what they're saying, recognize that we're not living up to it, and be really honest and self-critical about this. But if we're doing that, and we say, I'm still living within the church, even though I'm a divorced person, and I'm, I'm going to try to live within that ambiguity, God help me, I can do no other. That's simply where I am then I also have to apply the same thing on the side of homosexuality. Luke Timothy Johnson is Robert W. Woodruff Professor of New Testament and Christian Origins at the Candler School of Theology at Emory University in Atlanta. Earlier in this hour, you heard Rabbi Elliot Dorff of the American Jewish University in Los Angeles. Each of these men, steeped in the texts and the history of his tradition, presents a nuanced and complex understanding of the institution of marriage. This shouldn't be surprising, but it does stand in contrast to simplistic pronouncements we sometimes hear in our public life about the Bible's teachings. Rabbi Dorf's Jewish perspective is refreshingly realistic, with its focus on the goodness of marriage coupled with practical support in light of the difficulty of marriage. Luke Timothy Johnson's analysis of Christianity's ambivalent teachings suggests new ways to analyze why, in America's Christian-influenced culture, marriage is so puzzlingly troubled an institution. Finally, it seems important that these two devout, learned men have long been incorporating reflection on committed homosexual relationship into their broadest understanding of what the Bible says about marriage.